Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lesson <coughs> as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is entitled, The <coughs> Least of These, Ministering to Those in Need. And this is lesson number two in that series, entitled, Blueprint for a Better World. It's the lesson for July 13 of 2019. And it proves to be a very challenging lesson, in my opinion. But as always, let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we come to you with these words of wisdom to try to determine how they should impact us, and they raise a lot of questions. Help us to be serious as we look through these questions and and think about how we might apply them in our day. We live now down at the end of earth's history and we should, be, we should have been able to learn something from those who pre- preceded us. May that be the case is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God has always had a plan for this earth and that original plan, of course, was the Garden of Eden. But when that failed, God's long-term plan, the plan of salvation, was inaugurated. Down through the years, God has had to work with the select few who were clearly on his side. And it seemed like they were relatively few, doesn't it? Um, Some examples include Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But there were others like Job. It's interesting to note that these individuals were all rich men. Oh boy. (laughs) That's a bad precedent, isn't it? But God specifically promised Abraham, and I'm sure that promise belongs to others as well, that if he followed God, he would be a blessing to all peoples of the earth and they would be a blessing to him. Genesis 12, 2 and 3. I'm going to read those verses. I will give you many descendants and they will become a great nation. I will bless you and make your name famous so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, but I will curse those who curse you and through you I will bless all the nations. That's a pretty incredible promise, isn't it? The greatest part of that blessing, of course, was what? Messiah. The Messiah that came as a descendant of Abraham. But long before that, God chose to work through the children of his friends, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The descendants of these people we later were later known as the children of Israel because that was the second name given to Jacob. As we read through the Old Testament, we discover what an incredible journey that was for God. Wow. So, Let's go to the Exodus now. God's plan after the Exodus was for Israel's home to be placed at the crossroads of the world and for them to be witnesses to his loving care and the superiority of his form of government so that nations and individuals everywhere could hear the truth about the only true God. Do you think that plan could still be true? I mean, in, in Israel or... Are you thinking Could a of? group of people represent God so well that the whole world would want to know about him? Yes. Well, we read about that incredible promise that God to make, made to Abraham as he called him out of Ur of the Chaldees. He was told that one day the land of Canaan would belong to his descendants. Then 400 years passed. Our country, the United States, was formed just over 200 years ago. Think about that. 400 years passed. Who could have guessed at that point when it first that promise was first given to Abraham that hundreds of those years would be spent in Egypt and much of that time in slavery? What do you think the angels in heaven thought as they watched everything that was happening while God was apparently doing nothing? I think he was doing many things. Helping them to repopulate the earth, or what were they doing? Well, all the ordinary things that God does to sustain his people and to bless them, uh, even in that that environment, uh, yeah. preparing them for a time. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, then he was also waiting for the... Uh, the iniquity of the Amorites to be to be filled up. Then try to imagine their amazement when they saw God call. I mean, these are the angels now watching. 
And where, where does God go to find someone to help him out? Moses. A disgraced refugee, murderer, former prince, working in the desert, herding a bunch of sheep. And God says, you, come over here, I want you to lead my people. And what a job did Moses do, man. For those who carefully studied the lessons the last quarter about Revelation, this should remind you that God has waited how many years after Jesus' time on this earth to tell his story? Roughly 2,000 years. Are we doing our share? I love these words found in Exodus 3, verses 16 and 17. Assuming I can get my machine to do what I want it to do here. Hold on a second. Try again. Go. This is words to Moses. Go and gather the leaders of Israel together and tell them that I, the Lord, the God of their ancestors, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, appeared to you. Tell them that I have come to them and have seen what the Egyptians are doing to them. I have decided that I will bring them out of Egypt where they are being treated cruelly and will take them to a rich and fertile land, the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. So, as one of the leaders of the children of Israel, who just heard that message, you go home, and what do you say to your wife? And your kids? And your friends? God is answering our prayers. God is answering our prayers. And would they even believe it? No. What did you drink? There are probably only a relatively few leaders of Israel that heard those words from Moses. What do you think they said to their families, as we already noted? As we now know, God finally stepped in and did something about Israel's suffering. That should also remind us of something else we studied last quarter. In the fifth seal is recorded in Revelation 6, verse 10. And what does it say there? The blood of the martyrs those who had died for the cause of God was crying out at the base of the altar. And what were they crying out about? How long? How long? How long? When are you going to do something? Right? Yeah. Hmm. The children of Israel had served the Egyptians for a long period of time. Now God was about to call them out of their home in exile. But he was not asking them to leave empty-handed. They were to go and collect, in quotation marks, many valuable things from the Egyptians as a kind of delayed payment for their many years of hard work. And what did they use a lot of those gifts to do? Build a tabernacle. Build a tabernacle. A beautiful tabernacle. And what kind of government would God set up for the new nation? Try to imagine if you were responsible for setting up a new nation, making the rules and the laws, etc., Could you do better than the rules and laws that God gave to the children of Israel? I don't think so. Look at uh, Exodus 4, verse 31. They believed, and when they heard that the Lord had come to them and had seen how they were being treated cruelly, they bowed down and worshipped. That would certainly be an appropriate response, right? Right? Think, us what, think what this verse implies about God's relationship to human beings. I mean, here's a God who's just lost up there somewhere in space or maybe sitting in a temple inside of a metal or a, a stone statue and doesn't pay any attention to what you say. Here's a God that comes down and does something. Amazing. Well... There's some passages, Matthew 22, 37 to 40, and Exodus 21 through 17, talk about the, the greatest commandments and talking about the Ten Commandments. The Pharisees tried to trap Jesus by asking him which was the most important commandment. And why were they asking him that? Do you know? They had endless arguments among themselves about which was the most important commandment. So they thought, Okay, they had they have heard all the arguments on both sides. So they figured no matter what Jesus answers, they were going to jump on him because they knew the, the other side. And what did Jesus do? He didn't pick any of the ten. 
He went to Leviticus 19 and Deuteronomy 6. Well, can you think of anything that you could add to uh, add to improve on the Ten Commandments if you were starting a new nation? Many nations in the world, even today, have constitutions somewhat based on those original principles. Jim? While many of these statements are brief, we should not underestimate the breadth of their impact and the comprehensiveness of the Ten Commandments as the law of life. For example, the Sixth Commandment, You shall not murder summarizes and includes all acts of injustice that tend to shorten life, as well as a selfish neglect of caring for the needs, excuse me, the needy or suffering. Ellen White, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 308. Similarly, similarly, the prohibition against stealing, Exodus 20, 15, condemns slave Excuse me, slave dealing and forbidding, excuse me, and forbids wars of conquest. Wow. It requires the payment of de- just debts or wages, as well as prohibiting every attempt to advantage oneself by the ignorance, weakness, or misfortune of another. Patriarchs and Prophets, Prophets page 309. Do you think anybody's doing that kind of stuff in our day? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, you've got politicians, by definition, they, 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 you got the, the thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not covet, and uh, what's the other one? No, steal? Bear, fa- bear false witness. Yeah. You know, you got at least three three lies that they... By the way, instead of calling it the Ten <coughs> Commandments, it's better to say uh, it's a prescription mm-hmm. because it's a prescription for living, for life. All intelligent creatures will conduct themselves... They won't be stealing and all that well, sort of Well, back in Jesus' day, the young ruler, young, that rich young ruler came to Jesus and said, what must I do? And Jesus said, have you read the commandments? And he said, sure, I kept those since I was young. And I'm sure there's lots of Christians today who narrowly define each of these commandments and say, well, I haven't killed anybody today. <laughs> you know? But when one broadens the meanings associated with each of them, I mean, even wars of conquest is regarded a form of, as a form of stealing. So when one broadens the, associate, the meanings associated with each of the Ten Commandments, one will come up with something like the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. You know, it probably couldn't... Uh, when they came out of the land of Egypt, they weren't ready for the Sermon on the Mount. No. I mean, they were used to pretty uh, cruel... I'm going to take a moment just to look at those for those first few verses there, Matthew 5, or, or starting with 21. You've heard that people were told in the past, do not commit or murder. Anyone who does will be brought to trial. But now I tell you, whoever is angry with his brother will be brought to trial. Whoever calls his brother you good for nothing will be brought before the council. And whoever calls his brother a worthless fool will be in danger of going to the fire of hell. So if you're able uh, about to offer your gift to God at the altar, and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar, go at once and make peace with your brother, and then come back and offer your gift to God. If someone brings a lawsuit against you and takes you to court, settle the dispute with him while there is time, before you get to court. Once you are there, he will hand you over to the judge, who will hand you over to the police, and you will be put in jail. There you will stay, I tell you, until you pay the last penny of your fine. Wow. Can you imagine what it would be like to live in a society where everyone actually understood and rejoiced in keeping the Ten Commandments? Wouldn't God whisk us off to heaven as quickly as possible? But interestingly enough, almost immediately following the giving of the Ten Commandments, God began to explain some of the details to Moses. And if you take time to read Exodus 21 through 23, these chapters, there is a great deal of emphasis on how we should deal with slaves, which they had back in those days, widows, fatherless, and even foreigners. How well are we doing at following the principles laid down in those three chapters? Well, God intended for those who have been sl- who had been slaves not to forget what it was like or what a marvelous redemption God had given them. They were to tell it to their children over and over again. 
But the most important point of those chapters is that we are to help the needy, the homeless, and the disadvantaged. Try to imagine what the nation surrounding Israel in those early days might have thought about God's commandments. They came over, they asked their Israelite friends, well, you know, who, who's in charge of your government? They didn't have a king. Who's in charge of your government? Well, God is. Well, how does he rule? Well, here's our rules. Here they are. What do you think these people would have said? Wow. You mean you don't have an arbitrary king ruling over you? No. This is our king's rules. As we read the Bible, it appears that they were a blessed people from the very beginning, and people did come. Mm -hmm. did. I would want to, you know, I says, how does it work? But then as they came, well, yeah, we have the king, but then look how beautifully it works in your system. But it got into their brain, we want a king. Yeah. Well, well, even foreigners were to be treated fairly and not just killed as enemies. So how should people living in the more affluent societies of the world today regard those who desperately want to join their societies? People like illegal immigrants? Well, it's not as simple as uh, it is not letting simple. somebody into your house because you. Uh, we have countries, they have, they have laws. Even if your house is a rental house, you can't necessarily just bring people in permanently if the landlord says no. You know, what would happen if the government went around and said, I'm giving you two to take care of, and you get two, and you get three, and I'll get five, and Carrie will get one? Can we imagine that? Well, there's, on the other end, you know, how many, how many can we take? Can yeah. we take uh, several million from all the countries all over the world or a billion and uh, process and, and actually not destroy the country we, we have. So uh, I think what we've tried to do in some ways is, is do foreign aid where we tried to help those countries to, you know, raise and, and do better on their own. But uh, there are corrupt po politicians there who take advantage of that. And so it's a very complicated mess. We live yeah. in a world of sin. Allow me to uh, make a comment. Uh, this is statistical. This is the this is proven again and again and again uh, that we are the most giving country in the world. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We we are. We give more than United anyone. States. I mean, hands down. It well, and, and so you say we. You can talk about the United States, or you right. can talk about the Seventh Day Adventist Church. That is exactly Seventh Day Adventist Church. Again, right. way more right. even than that. Way more, way more. In spite of whatever flaws we have, but as as a as a people, as a people, we do more. Okay, well, let's look at as much detail as we can of the system that God set up and see whether it's possible. Maybe some parts of it anyway in our day. We Adventists have learned, I can remember learning this when I was in grade school, Malachi 3.10, bring the full amount of your tithes to the temple so that there will be plenty of food there. Put me to the test and you will see that I will open the windows of heaven and pour out on you in abundance all kinds of good things. Well, we have quoted that from the beginning of our study, of our, of our history as a church, and we have done way better than any other church in, in actually getting giving tithe. Now, that doesn't mean we've done well. The percentage of Adventists who give a faithful tithe is unfortunately fairly low. But uh, God was asking us to give a tenth of our increase, that is, our income, to support the ministry of the church. But God had an even broader plan, and here we go, Deuteronomy 14, 22 to 29. How, I wonder how many of you have heard a pa your pastor give a sermon on these verses. Set aside a tithe, a tenth of all that your fields produce each year. Then go to the one place where the Lord your God has chosen to be worshipped. And remember, that was in their day, it was at Jerusalem. And there in his, in his presence, eat the tithes of your corn, wine, and olive oil, and the firstborn of your cattle and sheep. Eat it. Do this so that you may learn to honor the Lord your God always. 
If the place of worship is too far from your home for you to carry there the tithe of the produce that the Lord has blessed you with, then do this. Sell your produce, this is your tithe, and take the money with you to the one place of worship. That sounds okay. Spend it on whatever you want, beef, lamb, wine, beer, and there in the presence of the Lord your God, you and your families are to eat and enjoy yourself, and do not neglect the Levites who live in your towns. They have no property of their own. At, end, at the end of every third year, bring the tithe of all your crops and store it in your towns. This food is for the Levites, since they own no, no property, and for the for, for foreigners, orphans, and widows who live in their, your towns. They are to come and get all they need. Do this, and the Lord your God will bless you in everything you do. Okay. Before you go away, yes. since it's going all over the world, I'd like for you to make a comment. That what does it say in the original Greek? That you drink this is wine. This oh, no, no, I'm sorry. Sorry, sorry. Hebrew, right there. That you eat and, and rejoice and also drink. Drink wine and beer. It specifically mentions beer. Okay. So, uh, There's two or three things that we need to understand about yes. this passage. First of all, the stronger forms of alcohol that people produce this, these days are produced by distillation. They didn't do any of that. So what they had was stuff that could be fermented directly from grapes or whatever they were fermenting. Okay, that was first of all. So it wasn't the you know, high percentage of alcohol that, they, that some people drink today. That's the first point. But these are the two strongest words for alcohol in the Hebrew language. No question about that. The strongest words for alcohol in the Hebrew language. So what is God trying to say to us? What God is trying to say here is coming together and taking care of the widows and the orphans and the poor and associating with the pastors and celebrating at the temple in Jerusalem is more important than some strict rules about what you can eat or what you can't eat. Don't all of you shoot me at the same time. Well, that's kind of an associated <laughs> key text would be yeah. Proverbs 31. Yeah. Give the wine to the poor so that they can forget their misery and their, their, remember their poverty no more. And then you use Deuteronomy 14 as a key text because we're going to make saloons for the... You can carry here a little and there a little. You can make up a lot of well, things about well, the Bible. We also read the same one who wrote that also says, Wine is a mocker, a strong Some drink is... is um, and yeah. Oh, Wh whoever is deceived by it is not wise. That is correct. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, what's going on here? I, I, the only thing we can possibly ex that I can possibly come up with an explanation for this verse is, is just what I said. God says, if these are the things that you want to... to, to these things that are make you happy, these are the things that, that you do when you come together to celebrate together, then do it at my temple. And don't forget the pastor, don't forget the poor, don't forget the widows, the orphans. If you do that, you're not going to be... This is not a drinking party. You don't do that with that in that kind of a setting. This is a you know you may have a little bit of alcohol with your meals. That's what they did. Um, but there was no refrigeration. No. So when you make grape juice and it sits, it it ferments. That just yeah. happens. It's it's fermented in my fridge because yeah. nobody drank the orange juice or the whatever it yeah. was. Men. We need to remember, of course, that the 10% of their income that was set aside to support the Levites was just the beginning. There was an additional portion set aside every third year for the support of the poor, including widows and orphans, that was kept at the local level. This portion may have involved as much as another 10% of their income. Wow. And I think what that... Who's... Charles. Charles, I think, yeah. In regular years? Yes. In regular years, this portion of the harvest was to be brought to the sanctuary and shared from there. But every third year, there was to be a special focus on sharing their blessings in their own community. In these harvest celebrations, there was a special focus on those who might easily have been overlooked or forgotten. You shall give it to the Levite, the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow so that they may eat in your towns and be satisfied. Deuteronomy 26, wow. 12. Really, wow. Yeah. 
Dennis? As a well, and to reread that, and uh, that was the NIV. This is going to be the good news. Every third year, give the tithe, a uh, tenth of your crops to the Levites, the foreigners, the orphans, and the widows, so that in every community they will have all they need to eat. Well, how do you how do you understand the words in Deuteronomy twenty six one to eleven? And it, it's in yeah, we didn't take time to read it, but it's an expansion. Maybe we have time to look at that. After you have occupied the land that the Lord your God is giving you and have settled there, each of you must place in a basket the first part of each crop that you harvest, and you must take it with you to the one place of worship. Go to the priest in charge at that time and say to him. I now acknowledge to the Lord my God that I have entered, unto, entered the land that he promised our ancestors to give us. The priest will take the basket from you and place it before the altar of the Lord your God. Then in, in the Lord's presence you will recite these words. My ancestor was a wandering Aramean who took his family to Egypt to live. There were few in number. They were few in number when they went there, but they became large and, a large and powerful nation. The Egyptians treated us harshly and forced us to work as slaves. Then we cried out for help to the Lord, the, the God of our ancestors. He heard us and saw our suffering, hardship, and misery. By his great power and strength, he rescued us from Egypt. He worked miracles and wonders and caused terrifying things to happen. He brought us here and gave us this rich and fertile land. So now I bring to the Lord the first part of the harvest that he has given me. So I'm wondering now, do you suppose that... Um, Every Jew is expected to memorize that and say it when they brought their basket full of food, the first fruits. Well, it seems to imply that. It says, then set the basket down in the Lord's presence and worship there. In our history as a people, what are we doing this? Me, growing up, where I grew up, this was great. We used to bring produce from, uh, from the fields you know, uh, to the church, and I'm not sure yeah. your experience. It was, those were great. I have great yeah. memories. Yeah. Every seven years, now let's talk about some more provisions of those early years. Every seven years, Israelite slaves would be set free. And a certain amount of readjustment of wealth was to take place. So what do we mean when we say that every, every seven years? What, what, what was happening there? Me? Well, no, I'm just uh, yeah. ask, I'm <laughs> asking you the general question. We'll get to you in a moment. <laughs> the servant was to be set free. If you had an Israelite slave... So, wh what kind of slavery are we talking about here? These are people who fell into debt in some way or another, and they, they sold themselves into a per period of slavery to pay their debts. At the end of the seven years, they were released, and their property was returned to them, or if, if it was gone or something like that. Um, so, on the 50th year, after seven cycles of seven years, there was to be a jubilee... What happened in the year of Jubilee? Land went back to the property. All land was to be returned to its original owner. And slaves, of course, should already have been freed if they were Israelites. There are rumblings in some part of the United States that we need a Jubilee today. Do you think such a thing could ever happen? How would it actually be implemented? And who would claim to be the original owners of every piece of land? Native Americans. Well, they would claim they would claim large portions, but there's huge portions that there was nobody living there. Mm -hmm. Would we be able to sustain ourselves from the harvest and profits of first through the six years? Well, Jackie? The regulations that God established were designed to promote social equality. The provisions of the sabbatical year and the jubilee would, in a great measure, set right that which was during the interval had gone wrong in the social and political economy of the nation. Patriarchs and Prophets, 534. And how would that be implemented in 2019, do you think? think well, we don't have a th theocracy, so there would be... So we don't have to worry about any of that? Well... No, but I'm just saying it's more complicated. Yeah, it's more, yeah. more complicated is right. You can't when, agree on it. By hardly and large, we're not a rural society. Mm. It's much crowded, much more crowded. Yeah. Communications are instant. It's a whole yeah. different thing. 
Missionary A can't get along with Missionary B. So can't decide. Now, we don't have to get to too do. personal here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I happen to know personally some people involved in this story. After World War II, it soon became apparent that it would be impossible to reconstruct the banking records of the German people. And even if you did, I mean, where's the money? It has no value. The government that supported that money was gone. So it was decided that a new currency would be invented called the Deutschmark. Every person who could prove that she or he was German was to be given 40 Deutschmarks to start over again. Does that sound like a good plan? You got to look at Germany today. It worked. Seems to have worked. <clears throat> Seems to have worked. The 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 man who, re who who suggested that plan was actually was a a guest in our house many years ago. Carrie. Okay. The Lord would place a check upon the inordinate love of property and power. Great evils would result from the continued accumulation of wealth by one class in the poverty and degradation of another. Without some restraint, the power of the wealthy would become a monopoly, and the poor, though in every respect fully as worthy in God's sight, would be regarded and treated as inferior to their more prosperous brethren. The sense of this oppression would arouse the passions of the poorer class. There would be a feeling of despair and desperation which would tend to demoralize society and open the door to crimes of every description. I'm going to interrupt there for just a second. Do you think we see any of that going on in our world today? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And are there any... I mean... God is suggesting one possible solution. Can you think of any other solutions? You can jail people who misbehave. And it costs all of us a lot of money to keep them in jail. Is that a solution? It's had its ups and downs, but it doesn't seem like it's working too well here. <laughs> it doesn't seem like it's working too well. I see. Well, you, if you have people who are willing, it would be good to provide means of for their education and their betterment. Uh, of course, there are those who are unwilling, and that's where the jails uh, well, are put in place for. And theoretically, one possibility would the jails should be educational institutions. Amen. Mm -hmm. And they ought to be places where we teach people how to live the right, eat the right kind of diet, and learn how to do the right kind of work. And we ought to have ways to get the imp to, to integrate them back into society. I can't help it but make a little comment on that one, what you just said. Uh, as you know, jails really don't in that themselves reform people. Um, there is a physician, his name is Dr. Abel, can Google. He uh, has taken violent, violent uh, uh, murderers and violent people and has done SPECT scan, SPECT scan, and has found defective blood flow in their brains. And uh, one little kid, a uh, 15 year old, and want to kill people and all kinds of crazy things, found a little cyst in, in the wrong place and removed yeah. their cyst as, as loving, as kind as. Oh, wow. So he has been helping thousands of people. There is, there is in Orange County, he has a clinic, and he's in different places of the country. Um, 83,000 scans. Mm. In fact, the lecture that I listened to, you know, and then uh, a, a very interesting. Mm. Uh, these violent, violent people, how as they put them through treatment after them doing the SPECT, the SPECT scan. So this is perhaps what we as Christians, believers, should be proactive, not saying, no, throw them in jail, throw them in jail. That's yeah. the way to go. Well, a few years have passed that up at Atalanta at the prison. They had an experience or experiment with a vegan diet for certain, and, yeah. and they had, it was very good results. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they were not violent, and, and uh, you know, they weren't drugged. It was just a, a, a good, a good a vegan type diet, and it improved. I don't well, know whatever happened to it, but uh, okay, Carrie, go ahead. These regulations were designed to bless the rich no less than the poor. 
they would restrain avarice and a disposition for self-exaltation and would cultivate a noble spirit of benevolence. And by fostering goodwill and confidence between all classes, they would promote social order, the stability of government. We are all woven together in the great web of humanity. And whatever we can do to benefit and uplift others will reflect in blessing upon ourselves. The law of mutual dependence runs through all classes of society. Can I interrupt there for just a second? <clears throat> Paul also said, let him who does not work not eat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How does that fit? <laughs> okay, go ahead. The poor are not more dependent upon the rich than are the rich upon the poor. While the one class ask a share in the blessings which God has bestowed upon their wealthier neighbors, the other needs faithful service, the strength of brain and bone and muscle that are capital of the poor. This comes from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 534 through 35. So, do we act like we believe those words? Could they be applied today? And what would happen, for example, if the Seventh Day Adventist Church decided, okay, we're going to we're going to we're going to implement that within our church? Well, what do you think would happen if nobody else was doing it? Well, that's where we would start yeah. uh, to some degree. Although we we do help the communities, as you've mentioned a number of times, each church has their. Mm -hmm. Their uh, uh, Dorcas, well, we used to call the Dorcas Society, but yes. Yeah. Um, so we have ways of reaching out, but uh, so many uh, of us are, our time is limited, our, mm -hmm. you know, because we're, we're as busy Ellen White says, we were, well. well, there was, Ellen White says there would come a time when it seemed like we were spending all our time just making a living mm -hmm. uh, something to that effect so it's yeah. uh, there can be those who are accumulating wealth and the others who are just trying to keep up and they're one yeah. paycheck away from the streets well do you remember reading in the Old Testament how well this system worked no never fully, why not it's never fully implemented was it we don't have any evidence that was ever fully implemented in the Old Testament. Here it was, spelled out for them, described in detail. Actually, in Ruth, we have an example. Well, there's a part of it, yeah, being implemented. There's, there's a bit there where they yeah. came and they gleaned the edge of the fields. So, I think, Carrie, you've got a comment there. I just had a long one. Oh. Second Chronicles, I'm sorry, this one's mine. So what the Lord had foretold to the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. The land will die, lie desolate for 70 years to make up for the Sabbath rest that has not been observed. What do you think that means? You know, there are, there are people who don't want to take the prophecies of Daniel and carefully work them out like we do. But they want to take a prophecy like this and say, well, let's see. Seventy years, we think, okay, that's seven. Every seven, every fifty years, there's supposed to be one year. So we have seventy of those, you multiply it out times seventy times fifty. Well, that means that, and they're working out all this and trying to figure out whether it's about time for Jesus to come back based on this prophecy. Well, does this, the question really is, do you, does this verse imply that they never actually did it? Did they ever actually have a jubilee? Yeah, the good news at the Bible, it seems to imply that. I, but I was looking it up in another translation, and there is kind of that implication that uh, uh, to make, uh, it doesn't say make up, but there was uh, some, something it implied that it wasn't done, you mm -hmm. know, to take care of what had been passed. Mm -hmm. Well, Jim, you've got something about that? 
There is nothing after their recognition of the claims of God that more distinguishes the law given excuse me, the laws given by Moses to the liberal, tender, and hospitable spirit enjoined toward the poor. Although God had promised greatly to bless his people, it was not his design that poverty should be wholly unknown among them. He declared that the poor should never cease excuse me, yeah, should never cease out of the land. There would ever be those among his people who would call into exercise their sympathy, tenderness, and benevolence. Then, as now, persons were subject to misfortune, sickness, and loss of property, yet so long as they followed the instructions given by God, there were no beggars among them, neither any who suffered for food. Patriarchs and Prophets, 530-31. Wow. Okay. So what's your overall impression at this point with God's blueprint here? Does it I seem, like it. You like it? Yes. It sounds really good. Mm -hmm. Does it seem completely beyond the realm of possibility in our day? Well, the biggest hurdle is that we don't have a theocracy. We, yes. You know, when you come down to the time of Jesus, uh, the Romans were in charge. And you did have a lot of beggars and, and kinds of things. So uh, the system had uh, was operating differently. Yeah. What what would happen if we said, okay, on Sabbath, people would come and say, okay, um, I earned this amount of money this week, and I only need so much for my needs and maybe a little bit of extra, and I'm putting this into the common pot, and those who have needs that haven't been able to meet their needs... Um, how would that work? It, it did not work in the early uh, Christian era. So the apostle says hey, it's not our job to feed uh, the poor. Uh, we have been called for So let's have these seven people do this work. I think. Okay. Yes, uh, remember, uh, yeah, that's what had happened. I think the prime example is what happened in this country in this century. <coughs> mm hmm we're all supposed to pull their weight, put this in the pot and all share it, but it didn't take them too long to realize that there were freeloaders there that weren't giving out. And that's what happens today. And then you've got politics that nearly drives us all crazy. Yeah, I'm sure that one of the first things that would happen if we implemented a, th a system like that in the Adventist church is that a lot of homeless people would say, whoa, yep. that's where it's at. Join in. Uh, the Dorcas. Okay, so you put your stuff out for mm -hmm. people to be able to come and get. Mm -hmm. And do you know every time you put your stuff out, do you know who shows up? It's ladies with Cadillacs. Mm -hmm. And they want to pile all the best stuff in their Cadillacs. Now where they take it, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Maybe they have homes, homeless shelters or whatever, but I don't think so. Mm -hmm. So the people who really need the stuff aren't getting the stuff a lot of mm -hmm. times. Well, it's the same problem, as I mentioned, with the uh, with the, uh, the government aid. You know, are, is there something we need to do beyond just giving that sort of organizes how that those funds actually get implemented? Uh, I, I've talked. Yeah. I've talked about the pantry that we operate down at Sac Clinic. And there are some people who come there, I know, who really desperately need it and they're helped. Yes. Yes. But there are also people who drive up in brand new cars and load up. Yeah. Well, in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, the ideas of justice and righteousness are often represented by a single word. I know the word in Greek very well, dikaiosune. How would you say that righteousness and justice are related in our day? Is it clear in your thinking that God has a detailed understanding of the thoughts, actions, and events of every life, every day? How does that make you feel? Well, <clears throat> look at, look at, let me just look at this. Rome, uh, Psalms 89, verse 14, Your kingdom is founded on righteousness and justice. Love and faithfulness are shown, to all you, are shown in all you do. And Charles, I think you've got something for us there. 
For I am not ashamed of the good news of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who is believing or has faith, both in, to the Jew first and to the Greek. For the righteousness of God in it is revealed from faith to faith, according as he had, it has been written, and the righteous one by faith shall live. Now I chose to put in Young's literal translation here because it's very close to the Greek. And there's, and it says what needs to be demonstrated here is the righteousness of God needs to be revealed. And notice, and the righteous one by faith shall live. And that's exactly the way it is in Greek. And you notice here, you can't tell whether it means the one is righteous by his faith, he's going to live, or whether it means the righteous one by faith shall live. The by faith could go with the righteous one or could go with the living. Or maybe, and which is very likely the case, Paul intended for it to go with both. And then Romans 3, 25 and 26 is a more revealing of the righteousness of yep. God. Well, if I may make a comment, um, Abraham's faith was counted as righteousness. Mm-hmm. Well, his behavior, and what was his behavior? He had a thousand people in his household and he taught them regularly. Amen. While righteousness has continued to be a word in modern terms which is closely related to God and his behavior, justice has moved considerably away from that ideal to include an enormous legal system set up to deal with criminals. Criminals. This resulted in a change in the general understanding of the word justice, unfortunately. Dennis? I think you've got a couple lines on that. Amos 3.2 Of all the nations on earth, you are the only one I have known and cared for. That is what makes your sins so terrible. And that is, that is why I must punish you for them. Wow. Does that sound like God is being fair to everybody? Doesn't seem like it, does it? Does it seem unfair to you that God singled out the children of Israel for his special blessings? Why do you think God did that? Why didn't God just pick those who were willing to follow his plan for their lives, no matter where they lived, what language they spoke, or the culture or society in which they were a part? Could he have done that? I mean, isn't that sort of what's happened with a Christian church? I think part of it, though, you go back to Deuteronomy 32, verses 8 and 9, from the RSV and the Septuagint and the Dead Sea Scrolls. When God separated the nations, he did it according to the sons of God. And he permitted these other Elohim to show, educate. Where do all these pagan religions come from? They didn't just conjure it up on themselves. The heavenly intelligences were, were influencing them. Uh, Satan is busy. Yeah, it's... it's but, God's, but, God's educating the good angels. Mm-hmm. That's what this earth has created, to hang on to the, uh, the two-thirds of the angels that, that hung around there, uh, Revelation 12. Yeah. Well, if you Charles, call, oh, go ahead. Uh, well, uh, look at Jethro. He was not a Jew. Or Job. Uh, look at Job. Look at uh, Melchizedek. Mm-hmm. Do we? No, she was. A, she was not. I mean, uh, Ruth, mm-hmm. straight Jesus, lineage of Jesus. You know, she was not Rahab of all things. Yeah. So no, they, he chose. Perhaps these are the folk who also. Uh, Jethro was a priest, I think, of the Midianites. Mm-hmm. Yes, so there were people who did follow him. Who were well, who was Midian after all? Or one of the descendants, <laughs> descendants of Abraham. A son of Abraham. Right. Yes, Dennis. Yeah, if you're going to call people or draw people, you have to have a focal point. And, and of course, Israel, uh, the nation of Israel, but would have been a focal point to draw, uh, just in the same sense as the temple was a focal point. Mm-hmm. Um, if you get too diffuse, then uh, uh, I mean, it, it's just two different ways of approaching yeah. the issue. You can be diffuse or you can be focal, and mm-hmm. and we need both. 
It's very easy for some of us living in more affluent societies to think less favorably about the poor and especially the homeless. But we need to remember that God knows all the details about every person's life. That could make a huge difference in how we relate to some of those people. See, for example, this story. Jackie? Right here, right? In contrast? Yeah. In contrast, consider the story of a business owner who learned a valuable lesson about interfering when he was not in the know. This owner decided to take a tour around his business to see how things were going and how efficiently his employees were working. He went down to the shipping docks and he saw a young man leaning against a wall apparently doing nothing. The owner walked up to the young man and said, Son, how much do you make a day? The young man replied, $150. The business owner pulled out his wallet, gave him $150 and told him to get out and never come back. As soon as the young man left, the shipping clerk came out to the docks, looked around, and then asked the owner, Have you seen the UPS driver? I asked him to wait for me here. (laughs) Never come back. (laughs) Well, how cognizant are the the members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church of the needs of those around them? How many of us live in our little cocoons trying to stay as isolated from the world as possible? Well, think about the Ten Commandments. If you think about the First Commandment and the Last Commandment as kind of bookends to the Ten Commandments, there are some pretty strong parallels between them and those two great commandments that Jesus talked about. Scan through the last six commandments. Can you think of any way you could improve on any of them? Our world is full of greedy people. So many are only concerned about what they can get for themselves and many, it turns out, cannot afford what they are getting. Excuse me. The amount of international debt is beyond fathom. The total amount of debt estimated at the beginning of 2018 was U.S. dollars, $247 trillion. What will happen to all those debtors in the Jubilee? Many of the more organized and advanced civilizations of the world have laws to protect people who fall into debt, but those laws have serious consequences. So how well are we doing at thinking about the needs of others? So many of us are so wrapped up in what we regard as our own needs that we hardly have time to think of others. Where does agape love fit in that picture? If the plan of Jubilee and the other regulations set up by God for the beginning of the nation of Israel had been followed carefully, would Israel have ended up being a poor nation? What might have happened? Gary? The contribution is required of the Hebrews for religious and charitable purposes amounted to fully one-fourth of their income. So heavy attacks upon the resources of the people might be expected to reduce them to poverty. But, on the contrary, the faithful observance of these regulations was one of the conditions of their prosperity. Again, this is from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 527. See Malachi um, 3, 8-12. Yeah. We'll get there in just a moment. Question. How much, what percentage of the average American, we'll talk about Americans here because we're Americans, what percentage of the average American's income is given to the church and or the government? Probably. Well, well, the government, you know, it, it depends on what they the don't tax ask. No. No. They demand. They demand. Right. It will so take. it depends on the, you know, how the tax laws are written at any particular time, and and whether you know how to create deductions and various things that can lower your. But if we if we gave a faithful tithe to our churches, and gave her generous offerings beyond that, and then paid our taxes, we would go more than 25%. Easily. Oh, yeah. Easily. Yeah. Well, Jesus had some instructions. I ask you, is it right for a person to cheat God? Malachi 3, verse 8 and following. 
Of course not, yet you are cheating me. How, you ask? In the matter of tithes and offerings, a curse is on all of you because the whole nation is cheating me. Bring the full amount of your tithes to the temple so that there will be plenty of food there. Put me to the test and you will see that I will open the windows of heaven and pour out on you in abundance all kinds of good things. I will not let insects destroy your crops and your grapevines will be loaded with grapes. Then the people of all nations will call you happy because your land will, will be a good place to live in. And I, never, I will never forget, uh, when I was a kid, I heard a story about this, about a guy who joined the Adventist church and they said, okay, you know, and he was out of a job. Had no job and he had some, I think he had $10 left to his name or something like that. And he joined the church and they said, you know what that says? A tithe is supposed to be paid to the church. So a tithe out of $10 was $1. He gave it, took it, gave it to the church. He says, okay, God, you said they'll, they'll pour out a blessing that you won't be able to receive it. He says, I don't know what I'm going to do. He went back and started praying and thanking God for his tithe that he was able to give. And the next day he got three job offers. Amen. <laughs> you can't Amen. take off. <laughs> there it was. So blessings so great that you can't can't receive them, and that kind of thing, of course, just sticks in your mind. How can you forget it? So where would you fit in a jubilee? Would you lose all your retirement savings? Would you end up with a fresh beginning, having all your debt forgiven? And would a jubilee every so often encourage people to incur lots of debt, hoping that somebody would just forgive it after a while? What are the spiritual implications of having a jubilee? Does this have any spiritual implications or is this just financial? Not sure? Well, based on what you said about people trying to take advantage of the system uh, shows, you know, because your, your spiritual condition is, is going to reflect in what you do and how you interface with that system. Yeah. yeah. But I, I'm sure that if a local church actually tried to implement, to a certain degree, a system like this, that uh, and if they were really Christian about it, things would work out. Our kind and loving Father, we have read in this lesson some very challenging ideas. Um, it's hard to imagine even how some of these things could be implemented in our day. But we know that you have plans for our lives just as you had plans for their lives. Give us the guidance we need in our day to reach out to those who are in need and perhaps lead them back to your kingdom is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.